On Sunday, she didn't answer us, and neither on Monday. The only communication that they had seemingly from her was by text message. When details started to appear of what had actually happened, it causes a lot of concern, a lot of fear as well. You could surmise that she'd been strangled or that the call had actually caused her death. A lot of the neighbours would have been shocked, but also extremely puzzled as to how this could have happened. We were suspicious about the lies. It's big lies, you know. I live every day with the fact that I was friends with a murderer. At the edge of London lies the village-like suburb of Kew. Kew is one of the most sought-after areas of London. It's in West London. Kew is an extremely wealthy area. It's within commuting distance of the city of London and its wonderful nature beside the river and the Royal Botanic Gardens. It's very leafy, it's a very well-to-do kind of area, but fairly low crime as well. So it's, it's a nice area for people to live in. There is definitely a village feel. We have a very small high street. Uh, you will find a lot of independent trades around Kew, uh, which I think that's what people like. There's a lot of artists and uh, TV celebrities, and of course, Sir David Attenborough lives there. It's a world-class site. Kew was the perfect place for aspiring French filmmaker Laureline Gossier Bateau to set up home in 2009. Lolan was my best friend, my close friend. She was like a sister to me. We always be united. We always be in touch. We just developed a friendship, more than a friendship. Our children called her Auntie Lolo, and my daughter has her name. She was family. She was a vivacious, very popular, well-liked young woman who was beautiful on the inside as well as on the outside. She was easy to like and was a very caring and considerate kind of person. The future seemed bright for Loreline, and London was the place to help make her career ambitions come true. She was born in Aon Provence, but she came to London to pursue her dream of becoming a film producer. Lowline had a lot of passion, but she developed a, a real passion for cinema. She was a passionate people. She was a determined people. She was a hard worker. She started her own production company. She got a Grammy as a production assistant on a movie with Dam Joan Collins. For us, it was nice and amazing, but I know for England was a dream, and it was a dream. Despite a successful career, Loreline was happiest at home with her dogs. Loreline was a dog lover. She loves animals. She had an Instagram of a video every day with her two dogs, Haley, a Yusuke, and Blake, a Rottweiler. Okay, so nice. They sleep on the they sleep on the bed, and we see that on Instagram every day. It's like they're sh her children for her. And on top of her busy life in the UK, Loreline stayed in regular contact with her family in France. Loreline was very close to her family. Oh yes, <laughs> she used to to call her mom. Every day, and maybe twice a day, you know, in the morning and the evening. So the family for Loreline is everything. Family and friends and pets was everything. In March 2019, Loreline was due to move out of her flat in Kew into a new place. Something friends and family were eagerly waiting to hear about. On Sunday, she didn't answer us, neither on Monday. 
and it was already strange. Certainly raised alarm bells the fact that Laureline had not spoken to her best friends and her mom and her family um, when she would normally speak to her mom every day and speak to her best friends very regularly as well. So the only communication that they had seemingly from her was by text message. But there was something unusual about Loreline's text. Her friends had received some strange text messages from her but didn't really chime with the kind of person that they knew her to be. For example, her best friend said that she thought it was strange that she said that she was going on a shopping spree in Oxford Street because she knew that she usually shopped online and got all her clothes from, from online retailers. She described how she was looking forward to getting a boob job and liposuction, certainly not the kind of thing that she would have said. So this kind of thing immediately raised alarms and, and they were very, very concerned that she just seemed, seemed to be communicating by text message, but nobody had seen her. Confused by Loreline's strange behaviour, her sister-in-law makes her way to the property in Kew. And when she couldn't find her, she alerted the police. Laureline was reported missing on the 6th of March 2019. And that means that a police officer would be dispatched to talk to her about her concerns and take a report. The missing persons inquiry started with questions to her sister-in-law and potentially any friends that could be found to say, have you seen her? Can you tell us when you last saw her? And the concern was raised because her sister-in-law had visited the address and she could hear dogs barking, Laureline's dogs, and no sign of Laureline. Laureline was a lover of dogs, so she, she would never leave her dogs alone. They were her children, essentially, at the time. And also, because it was now Tuesday, Laureline had failed to turn up for work, so work colleagues were now concerned. So you had a lot of people voicing their concern about where Laureline was, and that made it a, a concern for the police because this was completely out of character and completely unusual behaviour. Police begin their inquiries by also visiting Laureline's address. In a missing persons inquiry, police will attend an address, the place where a person lives, because within that premises, you might find something to indicate where they've gone. It might be a ticket, uh, might be a receipt, it could be anything. And also you want to make sure that they haven't come to harm behind locked doors. So there would be a natural instinct for officers to get into that premises, and quite often that's by breaking in, to check on the welfare of somebody. And that's what they did in this case. The officers went in, searched the premises, and she was not anywhere. But what officers could see inside that address was the boxes all still ready to be packed. It looked as if she was just about to move out. Her belongings were all boxed up, ready, as if she was about to move out of the flat straight away. So it looked like the home had been disrupted in some way. Back at the police station, officers assess the risk of Loreline's disappearance. A missing person is graded low, medium or high risk and different things happen at different levels. In the low risk you've got people who perhaps uh, there's no particular harm but you can think they might just have gone away and, and the concern is, is quite a low uh, for them. Medium risk, so slightly more work is done around that because people are concerned, but it might be within their character to go away for a weekend or something like that. So it's not necessarily out of character. Whereas you have the high risk category, and that's where Laureline sat because this was completely out of character. After reviewing the case as high risk, police returned to Laureline's address for a more detailed search.
They went out into the garden using torches. And in the garden, they had a look around and they could see various items leaning up against the fence, so a spade, shovel, other items that you would use in general gardening, and a bag of compost as well on the right-hand fence. And one of the officers then turned attention to the flower bed on the left-hand side as you walked into the garden and noticed that it was completely uh, brand new in one section. The CID officer moved the soil back closest to them and identified what they thought was the shape of a foot um, sticking out in a essentially a shallow grave and just a few more scrapes to see what was there made them believe that what they had found was indeed a body. Searching for missing French filmmaker Laureline Garcia Bateau have discovered a body buried in her back garden. As soon as you find a body in a shallow grave in a premises, it becomes a murder inquiry straight away because that person doesn't put themselves there. And that's when the process of the team start to make their own inquiries and all the different actions that come out of that um, initial deployment begin in earnest. With a murder investigation in progress, police secure the scene. We had a lot of this area all cordoned off, a lot of crime scene tents here. Because as you bring items out of the garden as well, you, you need to put them somewhere which is forensically sterile. And so we try to utilize the area out the back of the premises for that reason. So here really behind the house, the alleyway that we used and trying to set up a forensic um, retrieval here was, was quite difficult because the wind was so strong that it was hard. And obviously knowing how detailed you've got to be and how, um, you know, to avoid any contamination because it is windy and also you're dealing with an outside scene. It's particularly more complex than, than you would expect an inner scene to be. Arrive on scene, having been called by the homicide assessment team, usually, and we'll receive a briefing from the local borough police about what the incident involves and why it may be suspicious. Uh, once you've had a briefing, be wearing protective clothing, mask, overshoes, gloves, scene suits, and entering the scene to look for uh, to see what has occurred. The crime scene managers in charge of that scene forensically, whether they be physical exhibits that are taken out of a premises or whether they are swabs or um, fingerprints, they're in charge of running that scene. The recovery of the body is totally down to the archaeologist and he'll work in tandem with an anthropologist. Uh, their speciality is bone analysis, who died, how they died and where they died. Working together, they can rapidly maximise the recording, interpretation and recovery of the body. As the team removes several inches of soil, it becomes clear that the individual is in fact female. Obviously, your first thought is, well, Laureline Garcia Bartu is missing and we have a body in the garden and it's suspicious that she's missing, so... Obviously, my thought is straight away, well, this is probably going to be Laureline. But you don't go to a family with probabilities. You have to be sure. As forensic archaeologists continue digging, the level of brutality on the victim becomes clear. Once the body was removed from the ground, she was lying on her back, naked. Uh, she was wrapped in a, a mattress and... There was silver duct tape around the area of where the knees and the neck were. The, the mattress was then wrapped in a cord around the middle of it. And, but around her neck, she had a, a, an electric wire. She had a head bag on, and her arms were tied behind her back with duct tape. 
you could surmise that she'd been strangled or the, the cord had actually caused her death. You couldn't see the rest of the body to determine what else was there. She may have been stabbed for all we know, but that wouldn't be able to be uh, looked at until we got to the mortuary. As the body is taken to the mortuary to establish a cause of death and identify the victim, news of a murder spreads. For a young woman's body to be dug up in a garden in Kew, it would have been, you know, almost unheard of in a neighbourhood like that. A lot of the neighbours would have been shocked, but also extremely puzzled as to how this could have happened. I haven't ever heard of a murder in Kew. It's quite shocking to hear a murder in Kew. It's not normally uh, norms of, of, of anything. When details started to appear of what had happened, people become very concerned about, you know, something that's happening in your neighbourhood. It causes um, a lot of concern, a lot of fear as well. At the mortuary, the post-mortem gets underway. Once the body arrives for the post-mortem, he would look at both sides of the body for any bruising, any wounds, anything that uh, stands out to him. There was no obvious bruising around the neck, but when, once you get the body opened up and get under the skin, then the bruising can be seen. Be checking the hyoid bone, the bone under the neck, see if it's fractured, uh, and then it results in the conclusion that uh, death had been compression of the neck believe via strangulation. With a cause of death established, it isn't long before the individual is identified. As none other than Loreline Garcia Bateau. I was in my car alone and I just remember that it was Lowline's mother I hadn't found. So um, I just say the word, um, is it her? Is she dead? And I hung up. I remember I screamed. Um, I never screamed like that. It's taken a, a part of me. She was like my little sister, you know? It's taken um, a part of me. The investigation into Loreline's murder ramps up and initial theories are considered. Could this be a burglary gone wrong? It's a very attractive area for a burglar because there's a lot of assets there. So if someone's forced their way into the address and killed somebody uh, and then that person has disappeared, we need to identify them as soon as we can. So we'd be looking to make a light source examination, any finger marks that are um, not seen to the naked eye, fingerprint examination, uh, we'll be looking for any DNA that we can find, possibly cigarette ends, they, uh, things have been moved by the suspect, he I may have opened drawers, cupboards, so we'll be looking to examine those, DNA. May, he may have cut himself somewhere, so he may have drops of blood that, have, that he's left behind. But a closer examination begins to cast doubts on a suspected burglary. If it had been a burglary gone wrong, you wouldn't expect them to hang around and attempt to um, uh, hide the body in the way that it had been. Police take into consideration Loreline's plans to move home around the time of her murder. Could the movers have been involved? Could it have been a handyman that had, you know, come round and helped box up her belongings? After making their inquiries, police discover that no removal firm had attended the address. So focus switches to Loreline's personal life. Certainly from her communication with her friends, it was suggested that when she'd last spoken to her sister-in-law, she was looking forward to going on a date with a vet that she'd met. But it was very unclear whether that date had actually taken place or who he was, even. Um, there was very little information given. 
who had she been talking to online on dating apps? Maybe she met somebody else. That was certainly something that could be unraveled through looking into her mobile phone and computer. Police decide to try to look into Loreline's last movements to see if they hold any clues. You look at things like Loreline's finance, so where has she spent money? Which indicates that she might have been to a certain place, like a restaurant, which we found out on Friday the 1st, she'd been to a restaurant, and then that venue itself has CCTV. The CCTV shows Loreline dining with a man with the pair holding hands. And inquiries with those closest to Loreline soon identifies him. Loreline was in an on-off relationship for quite a number of years with a man called Kirill Belarusov. And this relationship had been going on for eight plus years, but had kind of fizzled out a couple of years beforehand, but they still saw each other on and off. And so they were aware that Kirill was in the UK as an Estonian national in the UK to come and help her move that weekend. Police continue to scour CCTV around the area. Both are later seen on bus CCTV, heading in the direction towards Loreline's home in Kew. It seems Kirill may have been one of the last people to see Loreline alive. But when police try to locate him, they find they are too late. They had discovered that Kirill was actually no longer in the UK. He had flown to um, Tallinn in Estonia. Belarusov has left the country. Police investigating the murder of Loreline Garcia Bateau want to speak to her ex-lover, Kirill Belarusov as he may have been one of the last people to see her. But police discover that he has left the country. The CID officers got in contact with Kirill Belarusov via a telephone number they had for him, which was given to them by the family. And they made contact straight away. He behaved like he didn't know what, what had happened and the last time he saw her, she was alive. Kirill tells police he was helping Loreline move on the Saturday, before she left Kew to move to a new address. But when asked further about this last encounter with Loreline, he doesn't give clear answers. He was being obstructive, in our opinion. He kept avoiding the question. I wanted him back in the country because I wanted to speak to him face to face. But he kept making excuses why he wasn't coming back, or saying, yes, I'm just going to sort it out, and then nothing would happen. He could do everything he could to come back. He was saying he'd be back on one day, that day would go past, we'd ring him and he'd say, I couldn't make it, I'm gonna do another day. And this just kept pushing back and pushing back. And you get to a point where you think, well, that's enough. I know he's, I know he's trying to avoid him coming back. I think the fact that Belarusov is not keen to help the police in their inquiries, considering that um, Laureline had been his partner for the best part of 10 years, is extremely suspicious. And the fact that he left the country around the time of her dis disappearance as well would have raised alarm bells. Kirill Belarusov soon became the number one suspect in the inquiry. But with Kirill refusing to come back, police need to apply for an extradition order. The police have a fairly complicated process to get someone back from another country. The British police can apply for a European arrest warrant uh, which is what they did. Um, so they applied to get Belarusov back from Estonia, where he was at the time. But for the Crown Prosecution Service to agree, the police need to prove they have enough of a case against Kirill. When you get a European arrest warrant, as this was, when you bring them back into the country, you have no power to interview them. So you have to do everything without asking them a question which is very, very difficult because you're not giving, firstly, someone the ability to explain, but also you have to reach that threshold of evidence, which means that as soon as they set foot back in this country, you can charge them straight away with the murder. With police needing to build a firm case against Kirill, they start to dig into his life. 
I met Kirill whilst working in a nightclub. It was called Egg, and we started working together, and that's how we met. Kirill was very charming. He was very nice. He was not, you know, arrogant or trying to tell his side of the story. He was always waiting for you to ask a question before bragging or saying anything. Kirill told me about Laureleen when we met. He didn't say her name, but he mentioned that he had an ex-girlfriend that he was really in love with um, and that they broke up. But Sabrina recalls how Kirill later spoke in more detail about his and Laureline's relationship and claimed she had cheated on him. He mentioned that he'd had cancer before and that he couldn't have babies anymore and that one time his ex fell pregnant and she didn't know that he couldn't have babies and that's how he found out that she cheated and that's how the relationship ended. He would always say that it was his fault and that she was very caring and that it was hard on her, the fact that he had cancer. So he wasn't blaming her, but he was saying that's how they ended it. Sabrina remembers the last time she saw Kirill before he left the UK for his home country of Estonia. The last time I saw Kirill, he told me before that he was going to die, that his cancer was terminal, and that was the last time I was ever going to see him. He said he sold his house, I'm about to die, let's go dinner. And I went to that restaurant crying, I cried most of the night saying, I'm going to lose my friend. With police still unable to question Kirill to see if his account of his illness is true, they turn to Loreline's finances to try to establish her whereabouts the weekend of her murder. Through continued interrogation of finances, we see that on Saturday, round about course to 10 in the morning, that there are transactions in Pets at Home and Sainsbury's, all local to where Laureline lived. So again, officers are there as quickly as possible to identify CCTV opportunities. And there you see Kirill Belarusov with Laureline again. So now we know he's with her in the morning. At a glance, all appears to be fine. But when police look at Laureline's finances a day later on the Sunday, there appears to be no sign of any purchases. Instead, they look into Kirill's finances. So we start to look at transactions that Kirill might have made as well. And what you could see on Sunday the 3rd of March was Kirill had left premises and had gone to a local retail park, similar to where Laureline and he had been the day before. He'd been to Sainsbury's, been to home base, and been to convenience stores through that morning and was purchasing items which were highly suspicious. They were the rubble sacks that matched the rubble sacks that were found on Laureline's body. He had purchased an axe, which we never found, and he had purchased soil or compost, as it was. And you could see the CCTV of him, identifying him clearly as the person purchasing those items. And so you could say straight away then that it's very, very clear what he was up to. That was now that Laureline had been killed and he was thinking of ways to dispose of her body. With Kirill's behaviour raising suspicions, police approached the CPS. We had to go to the Crown Prosecution Service and prove what we had using all of the information we had, CCTV, finance, witness statements, the crime scene itself, the condition of Laureline's body. And that was something which was very, very difficult, but we were able to prove at that point that we had enough evidence to secure a arrest of Kirill Belarusov. And that gives you the ability to get a European arrest warrant and bring them back. He was brought back on the 20th of March uh, and charged with the murder of Laureline. Kirill Belarusov will go to court the following day to a magistrate's court where, because it's murder, they send it to the Crown Court and then he's due to enter a plea some eight weeks later. And that plea is not guilty. So we knew at that point we are going to trial with him at some stage in 2019. 
And as the case is prepared for trial, potential witnesses are called in by the police and prosecution. The police called me saying we want to talk to you about your friend Carol, and I thought they were calling me to say that he was dead. They told me he's been arrested, he's killed someone. Um, I was in shock. I was like, are you sure that it is the right person? And they said yes. You don't murder, you don't think that you knew a murderer? Kirill Belarusov has been charged with the murder of his ex-partner, Loreline Gossia Bateau. The trial begins at the Old Bailey in London, and the prosecution open their case against Kirill with DNA evidence from the crime scene. The flex that was used to tie Loreline's hands behind her back, you could see that flex on the floor in the living room where um, it had been cut and indeed, the forensic testing showed that Kirill Belarusov's DNA was at the cut part of that flex. The jury hears of the early relationship between Loreline. You know, he came to spend a few days with Loreline at my home. He ate at my parents' table. He was a superman, a good boy. And Kirill had even boasted of his career achievements to Loreline. He had told people he was a stuntman and that he'd worked on films with famous people like Brad Pitt um, and that he was uh, training people. We searched in the, in the industries at Hollywood and we searched in the UK, IMDB, to see where was he in these films. And they're always shown if you work on there. He was nowhere to be found. These were all complete and utter lies that he told everybody. But the lies did not stop there. He began to say to lots of people that he was sick and that he had um, 10 years left to live. He didn't talk much about his cancer. You would ask him question and he would say, I'm bleeding from every hole. I've been puking for the last three days. I think it's just once where I said, if you don't mind me asking, what, what is the cancer? Where is it? And he said, oh, it's the pancreas, it's the liver area. And then the time after, he would be like, oh, it's spread everywhere. But he would never give any more details. He'd just say, I'm a guinea pig. They've opened me up and stitched me. They keep on opening me up. And, but he wasn't very specific. Loneline's mother, friend, and I found it very strange because he has nothing in front of us. When we saw uh, Cheryl, my wedding day, or for a holiday, we can't imagine he's sick. I've never known someone who had cancer. So when I saw him with a shaved head, I didn't question it. I didn't think he still had eyebrows. And I didn't know that you'd lose your eyebrows when you have chemo. We were suspicious about the lies. It's big lies, you know. We were suspicious. We tell that to low line. We, we explain to her to, to open her eyes, but she was in love. And we were discovering that almost all of his entire life that he told people about was a complete lie. Saying you've got cancer when you don't have, for me, is the lowest of the low. The prosecution also reveals to the court more about Kirill's double life. Every time he suggested he was going in for treatment to a hospital in London or just outside of London, what he was actually doing was going to stay with another girlfriend in London. That girlfriend also was told the same lie by him that he had cancer. So when he was not with her and saying that he was away for a few days, he was going to stay with Laurelie. It's only when I sat down in court that I realised that he was texting the three of us at the same time, his girlfriend, Laureline and me. So it was really like juggling between the three of us. 
with me, he was supposed to be in Russia having treatment and then he was actually in London seeing Laureline, talking to Laureline. I felt like a fool. I felt so stupid. It was so shocking. The prosecution described that as Laureline's film career began to take off, Kirill may have looked towards her with envy. He wanted a career in films as well, to a certain extent. He wanted to be a stuntman, um, but he wasn't, and he couldn't have been because he didn't have the skills to do that. He, his only skill was lying, whereas she was genuinely talented, and she was very, very hardworking, and she was prepared to earn her place in her chosen career. So I think there was, probably was an element of jealousy in the relationship. But it's details of a debt owed to Loreline which could point towards a motive for murder. She had given him so much money over the course of their relationship. And we knew you, you were talking plus £17,000 at least at that point. And that was getting to the point where he had to pay that money back. In November 2018, Laureline had sent a message to Kirill, and this was saying, you don't realise how much in debt, how much in trouble I am. I can't pay my rent. You need to pay me the money back. And from friends and family, we would always hear stories where he would promise this money. It's coming, I've got this job, this stuntman job, whatever it might be, which was all lies. So he knew he could never pay that back. That could be one motive. Secondly, she was at that point in her life now where she was ready to move on, away from him. And she was effectively a source of income for him as well. And that was about to dry up. To the court's surprise, Kirill gives evidence. I think the most shocking about the trial was himself. He took the stand and spoke and it was just, I think it lasted two days and it was two days of horror. Every word that was coming out of his mouth was horrible. The way he talked about me, the way he talked about Laureline, the way he saw himself, the arrogance in his voice. I remember sitting down terrified because I had been so close to him and just thinking, that man is a monster. It was traumatizing. I always think about the people over the years that have um, been in front of you in a trial and he's probably right up there as the most evil looking eyes I think I've ever seen. And because behind it, you can see that he really doesn't care. You know, his image and what he's portrayed himself as is more important than anything else. And he was really, really unpleasant and arrogant beyond belief during the entire four-week trial at the Old Bailey. The court hears how in March 2019, Loreline begged Kirill one last time to pay back what was owed to her. But instead, he used this opportunity to kill Loreline. You have the timeline of them going out on the Friday night, which we can see. We have the timeline of them going shopping on Saturday morning. She had booked a removal company ready for Saturday, but she didn't know where she was moving to because Kirill Belarusov had said he has found somewhere for her to move to. She had no money because he owed her a lot of money. She kept asking him, where am I going? And you could see that through telephone contact. Well, where is this address? I need to tell my removal company where we're going. And so the, the removal company basically said, well, I can't move you to nowhere. So it was all cancelled. Kirill Belarusov comes up with a new lie. This is, he's organised a removal company for her. But the removal company never came. And you get to the point then where Laureline is panicking because... She doesn't know where she's going, and she's clearly getting to that point in the evening where, on that Saturday, she's starting to disbelieve what he's saying. And that's when everything goes quiet. It's at this point that Kirill strangled Loreline with a cord. And the following morning, he was seen in local shops purchasing suspicious items. Kirill had been out and bought these items on the Sunday morning, which were used to cover the body of 
a Laureline. After returning to Laureline's home to bury her body, Kirill used her phone to send fake texts to Laureline's friends and family to buy some time. He foolishly used Google Translate to try and reply to the family members in French. And obviously, it's not going to sound very credible. It's not, it's not going to sound like Laureline, not the words that she would use. And, and the translation was extremely clunky. So it was immediately quite suspicious. And at the time that those messages were being sent, he was using the Wi-Fi of the address itself. So that puts him inside the address using her phone. Secondly, looking at pornography at the same time he's sending these messages, knowing full well that in that house is Laureline's body. And that really shows you what kind of person he is. It's very difficult to comprehend a person who has that kind of personality, that, that very strange and almost psychotic personality. By the time concerned family and friends of Loreline get in touch with Kirill about her disappearance, he's leaving the country for Estonia. I put my phone with video with him. I saw that he was in the airport. So I asked him, you are in the airport and your lovely law line is missing. Why are you leaving? Mm. There is no explanation, but it is. After a gruelling trial at the Old Bailey, the jury returns its verdict. Kirill Belarusov is found guilty of murder and is sentenced to 24 years in prison. About the verdict, we can't say that we are happy because our friend will never come again. But we are grateful for the jury and the judge to having seen him the real way he is and to not allow him to do that again to another woman. But even with Loreline's killer behind bars, the impact of his crimes are long-lasting. Today, we are more mistrusting. Today, when my friend meets a, a man, uh, I want to know everything. I want to know where he, where she is, uh, the address. It's changed uh, all of our lives. This entire story definitely had an effect on me. He destroyed so many lives, not just Laureline's. So many people that have been touched by his lies. So many people that believed he was such a nice person. And I think we were all a bit destroyed because we were all fooled and none of us saw anything. And if just one of us saw something, she could still be alive. The 999 call was made at 7.44 that evening. All that Mandy Joseph could scream down the phone at that point was, help, help. There were sounds of a gunshot and a woman screaming for help. And then the line went dead. There's been a murder. I said, well, what do you mean there's been a murder? He said, yeah, they found two women murdered up by the garage. It's got to be them. It's something that is totally unbelievable to kill them both. 
it was just devastating. And you just could never, ever imagine something like that happening in Oakleaf. It was vicious in the extreme. When officers reviewed the CCTV, they identified a vehicle that came down the pathway around the time of the murder, and these are the people responsible for the deaths. Parkliff, a quintessentially English village situated in the heart of Bedfordshire, best known for being the birthplace of British explorer Arthur Henry Newman. Parkliff is a smallish village uh, in mid-Bedfordshire, um, straddles the A5, it's a quiet village. Um, it's on a route between Dunstable in the south and Milton Keynes in the north. Everyone knows everyone really, so it's, it's quite a nice little place to, to live and to stay and to be, really. It's a lovely local community with a pub and a lovely little school. There's not a lot of trouble. It's a good little village. I'd say the community is quite close-knit. A lot of people know a lot of other people, so everyone kind of knows everybody. And central to the community and village life was Iris Jones and her husband. Iris was a much-loved figure in the village, well-known in the village. She'd lived here for years and years. Um, she was known especially for the fact that she had fostered something like 120 children, um, she and her husband, um, over a sort of 30-year period, starting in the 50s and, and going through to the mid-1980s. She was a woman who had fostered over a hundred children. The local community held her in the highest regard. She literally was an angel walking amongst us. Auntie was, once you got to know her, she had a heart of gold. And she'd do anything for anybody. She was much loved, uh, a caring, compassionate person who opened up her home uh, to countless children, uh, less fortunate. I mean, it become a way of life to her, fostering several children there who we actually grew up with. And as I say, she was, that was, that was her life, kids, really. Iris's husband died in 1993, leaving Iris a widower. She remained close to her children, including her foster daughter, Mandy, whom she relied on. Mandy Jones was fostered by Iris when she was about four years old. She's um, had a proper mother-daughter relationship um, throughout her whole life. Mandy was 34 years old. Um, she was a carer herself. She worked in the care industry. Her whole life was about caring for others. And when Iris's husband died, uh, she moved back in with her foster mother to care for her in her declining health. She was a caring girl. There was no nothing she wouldn't do for you. Iris uh, walked with the aid of a, a, a frame uh, and walking stick. She had heart problems. She had diabetes and she had failing eyesight. In later years, as Iris's health declined, Mandy took a much more active role in the care of her foster mother, uh, looking after her, caring for her, making sure she had everything she needed. Please, sir, can I help? The 999 call was made at 7.44 that evening and it was made by Mandy Joseph. All that Mandy Joseph could scream down the phone at that point was, help, help. Then the line went dead. If a 999 call is cut off or goes dead for whatever reason, um, the operator will review what they've already heard. In this case, there was a, a, a woman screaming for help, so they would then dispatch units to the house. Mandy's screams were not the only disturbing sound the police operator heard. 
with the sounds of a gunshot, uh, a woman screaming for help, and the control room inspector would then decide on the appropriate level of, uh, of response because of the high level of risk to both the officers attending and the public. It's a proportionate response to dispatch a firearms team. In this case, it was always going to be a firearms team. The call handers did try to call back and there was no response, but the police were able to trace where the call had been made from. And that resulted in police being sent to the property, including armed police officers, uh, who falsely gained entry into the house that evening. The house where the shooting had taken place was up a, a gravel drive and situated behind a garage forecourt. There's a petrol station, and by the side of it, there was a track that led down to this detached house. Upon arrival, the armed officers were met with a gruesome sight. They found Iris. Uh, she was lying by the sink. Uh, a further search of the house um, located Mandy in, in the lounge. The women had been shot. Um, Iris had been shot twice. Mandy had been shot four times. Shotgun cartridges were found at the house. Uh, so it's, it was clear to the police officers um, that uh, it was a, a, a shotgun killing of both women. Immediately, police get to work preserving the scene. Once the scene's been cordoned off, um, we'll be thinking about fast track actions. Um, what is it that we can do now um, to, to move the investigation on? The house was set back from the road, so was there any CCTV that, that could be uh, reviewed straight away? Um, what we want to do is try and identify the offenders as soon as possible. We were sitting here watching telly and all we could hear was sirens and a lot of commotion and I went out and I could see the helicopter flying over auntie's house and I come in and I said there's something up to the wife and at the time we had a phone and I rung up my father and I said there's something going on up auntie's house and then my father rung me and said there's been a murder and I I said well what do you mean there's been a murder he said yeah they found two women murdered up by the garage and then the bell began to sink in and I can remember my father saying to me then, uh, it's got to be them. And uh, that was a shock and half when we knew it was both, both of them. Quick assessments of the house revealed that there was no one else on the scene. However, it appeared that some items had gone missing. A DVD was taken. Um, the women's handbags were taken. The motive looked like it was burglary. Was this a burglary gone wrong? It was just devastating, absolutely devastating. And you just could never, ever imagine something like that happening in Ockliffe. I think everyone talks to everybody and it would be a very short period of time until everyone knew the situation. I mean, this is, this is a quiet area. People will tell you that. It's quiet then, it's quiet now. Um, to get a, a double shooting, two people dead in the village, um, truly exceptional. And the question on everybody's lips was, who had committed such a heinous murder? In a little, little village or little villages, things spread quite quick. And people were all concerned because things like that don't happen. It's uh, a nightmare. <laughs> this was a shocking crime for the village of Hockliffe. 
somebody using that amount of force on two um, helpless women uh, has only one intention, and that is to kill them. In the quiet Bedfordshire village of Hockliffe, news has spread of the brutal murder of Iris Jones and her foster daughter, Mandy Joseph. This is the house where Iris Jones and her late husband Clifford cared for 120 foster children. But this kindness was to prove her downfall. The local community, and it was a quiet little area, were obviously shocked by the whole incident and very sad at the loss of two well-respected members of the community. Everyone knew about it. Um, it was the talk of the village. Um, I, uh, as I moved along the high street, um, talking to people, um, everyone was aware of what had happened. Lots of people knew uh, Iris Jones, uh, knew Mandy, and um, they were just stunned that uh, two pillars of the community, two kind, caring people, should have had their lives ended in such a way. To me, as silly as it sounds, it's a bit like when Lady Di died, all went quiet, you know? And I think that's how it was. Um, there was so many police, police around and all that lot, but it shocked everyone, really shocked, shocked the villages, not just Ockliffe. With fear spreading through the community, police need to quickly establish the circumstances around the murders. Once the scene's been called off, the police will look for any fast-track actions, so anything that, that can lead them to the identity of suspects or, or the offenders. Um, and that will include um, any passive data like um, CCTV, AMPR, any phone work that can be done. But it will also include speaking to witnesses, the suspects, but also um, what we call victimology. If you find out how a person lived, you may find out how they died. Post-mortem results reveal that Iris was shot twice and Mandy four times using a shotgun. This is a, a very brutal murder. The way both Iris and Mandy have been gunned down with a shotgun, it's absolutely, yeah, it is, it's top scale brutal. It was vicious in the extreme. Mandy had been shot in the chest and also in the hand, which um, shattered the mobile phone she was holding to make the 999 call. So that's why it abruptly ended. Upon realising what was happening, she ran to the phone, dialed 999 and was screaming for help. But the phone was shot out of her hand and, and this was confirmed by the pathologist uh, during their post-mortem. With the emergency call cutting out when Mandy was shot, police confirm the time of death as 7.45 p.m. So can start to piece together Iris and Mandy's last known movements. The police have been out talking to residents in the area, doing house-to-house -house inquiries. And of course, they'd also made inquiries with the garage forecourt, where uh, there was a shop and they spoke to the staff there. Mandy had finished her shift at the, the care home in Luton where she worked and had arrived home. Um, but first she called at the garage forecourt and went into the shop uh, to buy some items, um, fire lighters, um, because I think the plan was to have a, a log fire that evening. Uh, so she brought fire lighters, um, she bought some cigarettes, um, said hello to the staff uh, before going back up to the house. And inquiries at the garage give police their first breakthrough. That garage forecourt was subject to CCTV, which was handed over to the police. The thing with this investigation is we can time the 999 call so um, one of the fast-tracked actions would be to review any CCTV in the area around that time. Um, and an obvious one was the garage forecourt because you had to drive past that or, th or through it to get to Iris's house. When officers reviewed the CCTV, they identified a vehicle uh, that 
came down the pathway and back out onto the A6 um, around the time of the murder. And one sees this people carrier moving in the distance, moving past the garage uh, along the track. And it was at a time which was about 10 minutes after a 999 call had been made from the house. And that's what led the police to go uh, to find um, and identify who was driving the vehicle and so on. Once we have the registration number of the vehicle, um, it was flagged on the police national computer uh, to be stopped and checked and reported back to Bedfordshire because they may be witnesses to the offence, they also may be the offenders. So it's imperative that we find them as soon as possible because we can put them in the area of the murder at the time it happened. A day after the murder and police track down the car in Suffolk. Inside is a couple, but that's not all. When they searched the vehicle, they found a shotgun in the back. Once the police find a shotgun in the rear of the vehicle, um, then they were arrested on suspicion of murder straight away because we've got two victims with shotgun wounds. So you've got your suspicion straight away. The police told us on that Monday they had arrested the couple along with a 14-year-old boy. Police named the couple arrested as 36-year-old Anita Mansfield and her husband, 46-year-old Michael Milcroft as well as an unnamed teenager. Where a shotgun has been used or a firearm has been used, it's vital that we identify everybody who may have been responsible or may have come into contact with the weapon. So in this case, um, the police forensically examined uh, the 14-year-old boy and that examination revealed that he had gunshot residue on him. He is showered um, with gunshot debris. So he was at the scene of the crime. So that's where the police start accusing him of being part of the murder. Once suspects are arrested in a case, that's just the start of the work for the police. There's a huge amount of forensic work that has to be done. We have to carry out searches at their home address uh, or home addresses. Um, and we have to speak to witnesses or people that knew them and dig into their background as well to see if there's any motive that we can identify. Police start by looking into the backgrounds of Anita Mansfield and Michael Milcroft to see how they could be linked to Mandy and Iris. Anita Mansfield was someone um, Michael Milcroft met uh, in the 1980s. Uh, he met her in a pub in Dunstable. Uh, they quickly formed a relationship. He then married Anita Mansfield and they had a family together. We do know that he may have worked as a, a, a pop man, um, a helper in a, in a local pub in Leighton Buzzard at one stage, but uh, to all intents and purposes, he was unemployed. He was a carer for an, Anita. She didn't work. She had health issues to the extent that uh, she told people she, she couldn't work. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of her neighbours um, thought this was a bit of a sham and that she was using... Uh, her, her poor health as, as a meal ticket was the way it was described. She was claiming benefits but always had um, delusions of grandeur. She craved a more uh, affluent lifestyle. Information found at the couple's home at the time of the arrest reveals they were on the verge of moving. Millcroft and Mansfield had, had set their hearts on buying a large country house in Suffolk. Um, really, they, they wanted to put their lives on a sound financial footing. They had lived a nomadic life of uh, living a very much a uh, hand-to-mouth existence. They wanted to buy a big house uh, for the family. They'd found a house to move to the dream home, which I think was one of the most expensive properties in the area. Uh, and uh, they wanted to go to that home with its swimming pool and so on. 
And so the house in near Beckles, that became the house of the, their dreams. And it was, uh, it was on the market, I think, for £740,000. The purchase should have gone through in the December of 2004. But again, Millcroft and Mansfield weren't ready. They hadn't got the, the funds. And so a new date uh, was arrived at, which was February 28. Millcroft and Mansfield were pulling the wool over the, the seller's eyes um, in relation to um, the funding for buying their house. With the couple living on state benefits and with no savings, police are perplexed as to how they can afford such an expensive new home. But it's not long before officers discover something of interest. They were renting um, a property and searches of that property found um, documents belonging to Mandy Joseph in the house itself. The documents are revealed to be life insurance policies taken out by Mandy Joseph 18 months earlier. She took out two uh, with different companies. One was Norwich Union and one was Zurich Insurance. Further investigations reveal that in the event of Mandy's death, her beneficiary named in the policies would receive a staggering £800,000. And this beneficiary was named as Anita Oakfield Bennett, also known as Anita Mansfield. Suddenly, police believe they have a motive for murder. For the insurance companies to pay out, Mandy Joseph had to die. Police investigating the murders of Mandy Joseph and Iris Jones have arrested a couple. Anita Mansfield and Michael Millcroft, alongside a 14-year-old boy. A search of the couple's home uncovers life insurance documents in the name of Mandy Joseph, which would pay out £800,000 to Anita Mansfield if she died. Their plan was to get their hands on around £800,000 and unknown to Mandy, um, Anita Mansfield had taken out life insurance on her life um, so that in the event of Mandy's death, the money from two life insurance policies would come to Mansfield and Millcroft. You can't just go out and take an insurance policy on somebody. Um, there has to be a lot of deception involved. And in this case, they deceived both Mandy and the insurance company. The couple were extremely cunning all the way through. They built up a picture of Mandy's medical history. They had documents belonging to Mandy they shouldn't have had. Um, they had a mobile phone of Mandy's that uh, was taken from the house. Again, it was, they, these were all things that could provide them with details of Mandy that would help them uh, in the, uh, the plan to set up these bogus insurance policies. Police now believe Anita and Michael fraudulently set up the insurance policies to help fund a new lifestyle. The plan was to buy this large mansion with the proceeds of, of, of that insurance policy. There were policies apparently taken out on the life of Mandy and they would have uh, provided uh, the husband and wife defendants uh, with a beautiful home, with a swimming pool and all sorts of other good qualities. To get the money, Mandy Joseph had to die, and that meant um, they had to kill her. But the question still remains. How are Anita and Michael connected to their victims, Mandy and Iris? Michael Millcroft was the foster son of Iris Jones. He had gone to live with Iris and her family in 1959 when he was just 10 days old. And Iris gave um, a stable home uh, full of love and, and, and warmth to, to lots and lots of children. And Michael Millcroft was one of them. So at the age of 10 days old, he was... He was 
living with Iris and brought up by Iris and her late husband and, part, and became part of the family. So for his whole life, Iris was his mother. I remember Michael, yeah, he, he'd be a bit younger than me. He used to play with us as kids. He was part of our family. It was said that Michael regarded Mandy as his, his si younger sister. Um, she looked at, on him as an older brother. Um, they were brought up together as children. They sat round the dinner table, went on holidays together. At one stage, Michael's girlfriend, Anita, even moved into the home with him. But in 1989, it seems there was a divide in the family. Iris and Mandy, Michael and Anita had all gone on holiday to Mallorca. There was a big row while on holiday with the result that when everyone returned, Michael and Anita Mansfield moved out. And that really marked the 12 year gap in things because uh, he stayed away from Iris and Mandy for all that time and didn't come back into their lives until around 2000. When Michael came back, he changed his name. He was always uh, known as Michael Jones. He'd taken Iris's name. But he was now calling himself Michael Millcroft. And he was married uh, to Anita. They'd started a family. And he was unemployed. It's believed that this is the point in which the couple devised their devious plan. For that to happen by a foster brother is just... Um, you, you wouldn't put that, would you? It's, it's something that is totally unbelievable to think that money corrupts everything. Um, to kill them both, uh, nightmare, nightmare. You know, we kept thinking to ourselves, no, it can't be Michael what's done it. With news sinking in that Iris' own foster son could be behind her murder, forensic evidence comes in. We have the forensic evidence, uh, DNA on the um, triggers of the shotgun, um, victim's blood um, on the shotgun, as well as Mansfield's DNA. These are the people responsible for the deaths. Police present all their evidence against Anita Mansfield, Michael Millcroft and the teenager to the Crown Prosecution Service. And they uh, decided to charge them with murder. There were murder counts and also counts of uh, attempting to obtain money by deception. With the three pleading not guilty to murder, preparation begins to build a case for trial. Starting with trying to prove that the couple had taken out the fraudulent insurance policy. Anita did much of the setting up over the phone. She would ring an insurance company, pretended to be Mandy Joseph, and proceeded to give Mandy's medical history. Um, saying what she smoked in a week, what alcohol intake, a general medical history, that sort of thing. These were all details that she had somehow gleaned over the last few years in the, the build-up uh, to the killings, and uh, it helped her in the pretense that she was Mandy Joseph on the phone. With the policy set up, there was only one thing left to do. Mandy's death was essential for the claim to be made on insurance. It was a racing certainty that Iris would be in the cottage because at that time she was housebound. So they both had to be killed if they were going to succeed in getting the insurance money. It's hard to believe that anybody thought they could get away with it. I mean, to us, You've got to be a little bit sick in the head to think that you can get a, away with something like that to start off with. With the trial looming, defence barristers are appointed for the three defendants. I've done many murder trials, either prosecuting or defending. 
The first I knew about this case was I was instructed in the autumn of 2005, and because the police and the CPS uh, had chosen to charge the boy with being a murderer, uh, he went into custody. So he's remanded in custody, and he goes to a small specialist unit where I visited him. But there was one piece of information which hadn't yet been revealed about the 14-year-old boy. He was their son. And I think potentially the most evil part of the case was that the parents thought they could blame their son and get away with it. In Bedfordshire, Michael Milcroft, Anita Mansfield and their own son have pleaded not guilty to the murder of Iris Jones and her foster daughter, Mandy Joseph. The trial begins at Luton Crown Court. The defendants in the case were uh, a mother who complained of ill health, a father who was a rather pathetic sort of individual, and their 14-year-old son who left the premises covered in uh, gum powder. What was revealed in court was the lengths that they went to to plan this murder. The court hears exactly what unfolded on that fateful day. It was just an ordinary day. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was known that uh, Millcroft and Mansfield were coming to the house that evening. Uh, and that's one of the reasons uh, that she called into the shop, because uh, the plan was to have a log fire burning for them when they arrived to make it homely and welcoming. And so Mandy had called into the shop to buy um, fire lighters and uh, to help get the fire going. Iris, he was waiting for him in the kitchen, having made a cup of tea and got a, a log fire roaring. The first shot would have been delivered to the foster mother. She goes down on the ground in the kitchen. Mandy came into the kitchen, having heard the shot, and received the second barrel. Uh, she staggered out of the kitchen, and the son was able to describe to me that uh, his father, having fumbled with the shotgun, reloaded it, went out into the hallway, and shot uh, Mandy a second time. At one point, Mandy Joseph had been on her knees, um, having received a, a shotgun blast, but she was still on her knees when she was shot again. Mandy still wasn't dead, so he fired in bullets, a uh, shotgun into her again a couple of times, and uh, then returned to the kitchen where his foster mother was still breathing. So she heard the killing and he fired at her, finally killing her, and then left the premises. In those last seconds of their lives, um, for Mandy and Iris, it must have been truly terrifying. In the execution of their crime, the couple went to great lengths to make sure their plan didn't fail. They even planned to alter the shot in the shotgun cartridge Normally, a shotgun cartridge will fire small ball bearings and, and they will spread out into a certain pattern. In this case, they used hard, uh, harder and larger ball bearings. Um, absolutely lethal uh, and illegal to, to change the shot as well. The jury also hears how the couple went even further to try to distance themselves from the crime by blaming their son. Here were two defendants, 
saying that it was the third defendant that did it. They were totally innocent. If there was any dishonesty shown by them when they were first seen by the police, it was because they wanted to protect the boy. That was their story. His story, of course, was that he simply wasn't involved. I think potentially the most evil part of the case was that the parents thought they could blame their son and get away with it. I relied upon the 14-year-old boy, he was then 15 when I represented him, relied on his recollection. He was the only witness to the killing and his recollection was clear and it seemed to fit in with other evidence. The young boy was able to tell the police that he was aware that Millcroft and Mansfield had been planning the deaths of the women for some time and that various ways of killing them had been discussed and, and thought about. They sent the 14-year-old son to the library to research on poisoning. He did what he was told. He went and looked in the library and read about one or two things and reported back on it. Researching not just an insurance scam followed by a shooting, but other methods that uh, how Mandy should be killed, um, including looking into poisoning her, looking into electrocuting her, um, looking into uh, masonry, heavy masonry falling onto her, or that she would be the victim of a mugging gone wrong. But it was clear um, from the evidence that was presented that they've manipulated him as he was growing up. Anita's defence um, mirrored that of her husband. Both claimed they heard the firearm discharged and the father left the vehicle and uh, went in and found this dreadful scene. She claimed to have remained in the vehicle uh, outside the cottage. Her, her husband went in and then left a few minutes later together with um, the boy. The thing I remember most about this investigation was the sheer callousness and brutality of the murder, and the callousness to um, take out life insurance policies because they wanted a house, and the brutality to murder two innocent women so that you can buy that house. It's just, it's evil. After weeks of hearing evidence, the jury retires to consider their verdict. The 14-year-old boy was found not guilty in this case. He wasn't wicked, and he wasn't a killer. And that's what the jury must have been satisfied for by, at the end of their deliberations, that he had not been proved to be any part of the murder. Then the jury delivers its verdict against Anita Mansfield and Michael Millcroft. The evidence in this case was overwhelming. We have the forensic evidence um, there's Millcroft's fingerprints on the trigger uh, of the shotgun, as well as Mansfield's DNA. The 14-year-old boy had shotgun residue uh, on his person. Um, we've also got the CCTV from the time of the murder. Um, and we've also got the shotgun found uh, in the back of Millcroft's car. Adding to that, the documentation belonging to Mandy Joseph found at the rented um, property in Suffolk as well as all the financial documents which identified fraudulent life insurance policies. So, yeah, pretty damning. And it appears the jury agreed. Both were found guilty of murder. Anita Mansfield received a sentence of 30 years and Michael Millcroft uh, received a sentence of 25 years. Mansfield got the longer sentence because the judge found that she had been the prime mover in what happened. In putting together the plan, she had been the cold, calculated director of operations. Millcroft had very much been a passenger in what happened. And the reality was that this was a vicious, mean, wicked killing. And I seem to remember 
an observation by the judge that they had shown no remorse at any time, and that was clearly the case. The judge said this was, um, it was no sudden spur of the moment killing. They never once apologized for, um, for what had happened. Um, they showed no remorse. And the case has left its mark. When you leave the court afterwards, you never forget the tragedy of the death of the two women. I think the saddest thing about this crime is how little um, Millcroft and Mansfield valued the lives of, of, the, of their family. What the, why they done it, I'd, well, I know why they done it, they done it for money, but why anyone would think they could get away with it, it's quite unbelievable, really. I've been a policeman now for nearly 29 years and I've, I've dealt with some very nasty people, but I've never come across any people quite so evil. Following the sentencing of Millcroft and Mansfield, Iris's natural son, Brian, revealed how his mum would have been looking forward to her foster son's visit on that fateful day. First thing she'd do would be at the kitchen sink to make a cup of tea. And uh, that's how she would have greeted them. Hello, love, do you want a cup of tea? And then they shot her. I mean, Mandy would still be here now, and even today. There's not many days you don't... Something triggers your mind and you think of Mandy and our, my auntie Iris. That's all I can really say. The death of, of Iris and Mandy, these were women that had given their lives to, to, to helping and caring for other people. Iris especially, she had taken Michael into her arms when he was just 10 days old. Truly, truly shocking and uh, really, really upsetting. <laughs>